Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to stand up. I was hoping that I'd be speaking at church today and um, the, for the first time behind the pulpit in over a year, but that didn't work out. We're still trying to deal with some issues related to everybody being able to see the service and, and hear it well. Um, so once we uh, get that taken care of, I'm sure we'll uh, have people attending physically at church again, and I look forward to that opportunity. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in my basement. We have a, a finished downstairs and a kitchen area, and there's a countertop that's just the right height for my laptop computer so that I feel like I'm uh, speaking at, at a podium. I'm going to stand up and talk to you that way today. Uh, this morning, I noticed on Facebook, I'm friends with Apostle Art Smith, and probably a number of you are as well. And he's speaking to a Zoom group in the Pacific Northwest, and he had a little uh, blurb to write about his preparation for talking about the 23rd Psalm, and I thought I'd share it with you because it, uh, I thought it was kind of interesting. He said, it's fun coming up with things to say about the 23rd Psalm. I always want to find something new shining out of the scripture, but this one is like the Mona Lisa of Bible passages. It's been memorized and internalized, examined and contemplated by more people than maybe any other sacred writing. And he's absolutely right. That's the challenge of trying to speak with the 23rd Psalm as the, the basis for the message. Uh, we heard it read this morning uh, by Sharon and Dennis. And uh, by the way, um, you can see the picture behind me. I thought uh, one of the things that I would do to um, maybe make the message a little different or a little more interesting is to share the picture that's in my background this morning. I'm going to put on my Harry Potter cloak of invisibility just for the first couple of minutes and let you see uh, that picture of the young shepherd, uh, modern day shepherd in Palestine wearing his hoodie, uh, carrying one of the sheep uh, who is either injured or, or needed some attention, uh, just the same way as some of the pictures that we've seen of Jesus and the sheep this morning. Uh, we heard the 23rd Psalm read by Sharon and Dennis. I like the take on it, uh, comparing a more traditional reading to the, to the modern readings. We've had uh, inferences of the 23rd Psalm in some of our music today. And it's pretty easy to see from, the, um, from what we've shared so far that Christianity is deeply attached to the image of Jesus as the, as the Good Shepherd. Uh, we, we read from the book of John, Jane and I did, that Jesus is the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, and we've seen one of the beautiful pictures of Jesus, and thank you, Karen, for preparing uh, the, the slides for us today, and Jesus is holding the lamb in his arms. I grew up uh, part of my uh, young years in my grandmother's home, uh, seeing that picture on her wall every day, or one that was very similar to it. And so that's an image that is deeply embedded in my understanding about, uh, about Jesus. Some of us may still have those pictures hanging on the walls in our homes. Um, I don't know how or, or when uh, the writers of the New Testament first uh, thought of Jesus in this way. I know that oftentimes in the New Testament, the writers were trying to uh, show that Jesus had some equal standing with the, with the great prophets of the Old Testament, the great people and heroes of the Old Testament. And I think of Moses, uh, who was a shepherd uh, working in his father-in-law's uh, fields, guiding the flocks before he was called uh, to go back and to rescue uh, Israel from the hand of the Egyptians. And David, who I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later, was also a shepherd and a great hero of the Old Testament. And so Psalm 23, while it has been borrowed by uh, Christian interpreters and artists, uh, really was written originally for Hebrew worship. And so that's going to be my contribution this morning to your understanding uh, about this psalm. And I'll take off my invisibility cloak now and come back and be with you. Uh, so uh, if, if we think about Jesus in the pictures uh, with the sheep, uh, that, that's a Christian interpretation. But for the ancient Israelites, this 23rd Psalm uh, was an image of Yahweh God as the Good Shepherd. God as a Good Shepherd providing for the needs of his people and protecting them when they needed that protection. 
this psalm was most likely written as most of the psalms were during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. When Israel was away from their homeland, their temple had been destroyed, and they needed to have a great hope in God and a reassurance that God's people had not been abandoned by Yahweh. And so this psalm, even though it's identified uh, as being a psalm of David, the great shepherd king of Israel, is going to evoke memories for people uh, in captivity of a time uh, when they were living in their home country in, in Israel, when King David, who was a mighty king and for the most part a pretty good king, uh, sat on the throne. And, and the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. It was a time when they would reflect on that and they would imagine uh, uh, what it was like uh, for Israel to be able to control its own destiny rather than to be under the oppression of a foreign power. It was a better time, uh, and, and Israel was eager uh, to claim during that time period that God had blessed them richly and was thankful for those moments. And all of that's caught up in this writing of the 23rd Psalm. The psalmist begins by speaking to the listeners, to the worshipers who would come together in the local synagogues on the Sabbath. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It expresses a very personal relationship with God that uh, many times we joke about Tevye in The Fiddler on the Roof and the way he constantly talked to God. He had a very personal relationship with God. And in the Old Testament, that was the sense that many times people would have as they went through their daily lives. Uh, talking to their Lord periodically about how life was going. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And my version is a little bit different than uh, what Sharon used. This is from the Revised Standard, so the language is, is altered just a bit. But in the psalmist's mind, this is the legendary King David who slew the uh, Philistine Goliath, uh, the giant Goliath with nothing more than a shepherd's sling. This is David, the mighty king who had been anointed uh, by God as God's chosen to lead the, uh, the Israelites. And even David needed a shepherd. He needed a provider. He needed a protector. And for David, in the mind of the psalmist, that protector, that shepherd was Yahweh. The description of green pastures and still waters implies that God intends that we want for nothing, that everything that we need to sustain life is available, and it's not just uh, meager pickings, it's actually something that's wonderful and nourishing and good for us. The idea of a table being prepared for us actually goes back to early practices when the shepherds would go out and prepare a pasture for the sheep to graze. And before they would bring the sheep out into the pasture, the shepherds would go out and they'd clear out all of the thistles and they'd pick out the poisonous plants that might be harmful to the sheep. And if they found nests of poisonous snakes or scorpions that live in the Middle East, those would be destroyed before the sheep would brought in, were brought in. And even in the Middle East today, when the shepherds go out and get a field ready uh, for the sheep to graze. It's known in their native languages as preparing the table. They still call it preparing the table for the sheep. And the psalmist had the same sense that God, as the good shepherd, had done this for the people. The idea of having our souls restored was not a comment about life in the hereafter, but about the quality of life in the present time. See, the ancient Israelites had a very holistic understanding about the relationship between the soul and the body, and they would not have even been able to conceive of the two of them ever being separated. That came much later. That was Greek philosophy that first postulated that maybe the soul was a separate entity. But what's used for soul in that part of the scripture is the word nepis, the Hebrew word nepis. And as um, Dennis read in his New English uh, version of the 23rd Psalm, that has been taken the word soul and translated it properly. What it literally means is breath. Breath, the animating force that's associated with a living being. When God breathed life into the nostrils of the first human, he gave nepus, 
he gave breath to man and the man was alive. When I work in my job in the operating room, uh, providing anesthesia for a patient, and we're getting ready to wake that individual up from anesthesia, we all stand there patiently waiting for breathing to begin again, because we take away the ability to breathe under anesthesia uh, with medications. And so we watch for the rise and the fall of the patient's chest, and that signals that the patient is alive and doing well, and it makes all of us feel good that we've had a successful anesthetic. How often have we felt crushed down by the weight of life? To the point where we might want to say, I'm so weighed down right now by my work and my responsibilities and all the things I'm doing for church or whatever, or I'm weighed down by what's going on in the world or just by life in, in general, and I feel like I can't even breathe anymore. And so we do something to, to take some downtime for ourselves. We plan a vacation if we can, or we go for a walk in the outdoors and we get the fresh breeze in our face or some sunshine. Or maybe we realize that what we need is some rest and so we get a full night's sleep or whatever it might be that rejuvenates us. And we find ourselves saying, I can breathe again. I can remember going on a fishing trip with my dad some years ago in Northern Arkansas. And we rented uh, a hotel room, stayed for a couple of days. Uh, we uh, hired a guide to take us out on the White River and we went fly fishing for trout. And we had a great day. The fishing was wonderful. Uh, the day was beautiful. The temperature was just right. The sun was shining down on us. It was so restoring. And we pulled off over to the bank and the guide fixed us a delicious lunch of cooked trout that we had caught and we just relaxed. And I turned to my dad and I said, you know, I feel for the first time, you know, this was a time in my life when I was busy with my work and we had young children and there was just so much going on. And I said, dad, I feel so relaxed right now, like I can breathe again. And I think that's what the psalmist had in mind when he said that God had restored his soul because its breath had been given back to him, I can breathe again. In the middle of the Psalm, the writer begins talking not to the congregation, but now directly to God. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You're anointing my head with healing oil and my cup is overflowing. How many people do you know that have served in the armed forces who have talked about this passage and the special meaning that it had for them when they served in combat zones? And I'm familiar with those situations. I've been in combat zones twice in my military time. And I can remember the stories that my dad told of his time in Vietnam as a medevac helicopter pilot. And he would have to be, uh, he would have to fly into a hot landing zone uh, with people shooting at his aircraft in order to retrieve wounded soldiers. And he would hear in his mind the words of the 23rd Psalm. So I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you are with me. And he always felt that God had delivered him out of those situations. But I'd like to suggest to you that we all walk through that very same valley every day. Someone once said, it's the greatest act of courage to get up and to get ready and to go out, leave the house and go out into the world. None of us knows what's going to happen on any given day. In our world, there are risks everywhere, on the road, in schools, at work, in the grocery stores, at Walmart, at a concert, at a movie theater, even in church or in a synagogue. People's lives have ended in all of those places. And just think what we have been together, uh, through together in the past year with the pandemic. We all know somebody who didn't survive. In my life, I've had close friends who died way too young on vacation. One of them riding a jet ski, another one whitewater rafting, another friend who had a fatal heart attack while he was playing a pickup game of basketball with church friends. We don't have to go to war to find out how fragile life can be. We walk through that valley every day. And yet we do so largely without fear, 
and we feel the presence of God in our lives, and we're reminded that life for the most part is good. And every day that God gives us is a blessing. The psalm finishes by talking to the congregation again. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. We Christians tend to interpret this to mean that we're going to live with God in eternity. And that's, that's fine. We use the scripture in that sense in memorial services, in celebration of life services for our family and friends who have died. But the original intention of that statement was far more literal. Dwelling in the house of the Lord was a reference to a person who spent their life living in the temple in Jerusalem as a place of sanctuary. If somebody accidentally committed a crime, if, if they did something that was responsible for the accidental death of another person, the law provided for that individual to go to the temple and he would stay there for the remainder of his life serving God. And it would be there in that temple, in that house of God, where one who did not deserve it could find goodness and mercy and welcome despite his mistake. I know that doesn't seem quite as fulfilling as thinking of spending eternity of heaven, and I wouldn't dissuade you from doing that. But it speaks to the possibility of finding forgiveness and redemption in this life and to the hospitality and the sanctuary provided by a loving God. We all need a little redemption from time to time, don't we? There's a lot packed into 110 words, if I counted correctly, of the 23rd Psalm. But what I feel is the true essence of the message has to do with how we worry. In our adult church school class, we've been talking about the admonitions of Jesus as he talked to his disciples, and he said, you know what, don't worry so much about everything. Be reassured that God wants to share with you the kingdom on earth. I think the 23rd Psalm is pretty foundational for his thinking because our lives are so often filled with worry. Some of the things that I worry about, am I going to get my next lecture ready in time for my students? What are we going to fix for dinner tonight? What am I going to do about my leaking roof? Am I going to have time to get my car in to get the oil changed this week? Am I ever going to feel optimistic about the world again? When will I feel safe going out in public? Maybe we worry about the existential stuff. Is today the day that I'm going to get sick? Are my friends and my family going to be safe today? When are people going to stop hurting each other? Why do we have to walk through these dark valleys any day, anyway? Why can't every day be a mountaintop day? Is love going to win out over hate? Is my life making a difference in the world for somebody else? In the original Psalm, the writer used a common Old Testament literary technique that's lost to us in the English translation. But in the Hebrew, there are an equal number of words in the first half of the Psalm and an equal number of words in the second half of the Psalm with a simple affirmation that divides the two parts. And those are the words, for you are with me. For you are with me. If we were to choose five words to summarize the message of Psalm 23, for me, it would be those words. You are with me. In the midst of all our worries, we're reminded that God is good, that God has prepared the way for us. And it's not about the blessings that we may be praying for today. It's about the blessings that we have already received and perhaps not fully recognized or not fully appreciated as we should have. The field has already been prepared by the Good Shepherd. The grass is green now and sweet. The water is pure and still. Our heads have been anointed with healing oil. Our cups already overflow. And we find goodness and mercy as we live our lives in God's temple that we call the earth. 
whatever the challenges of life, whatever our worries may be, however hopeless things may seem from day to day, God is with us. And so shall it always be. Amen.